So y'all at Acts chapter 17, okay, cool. Well, here is the deal. Speaking of being on a missionary journey and speaking about things being tough, you know where Paul is right now? He is in a tough city. Okay, Acts chapter 17, and this is going to be beginning in verse 16. Paul is in the city of Athens. Paul is in the city of Athens. They were on their second missionary journey, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, you might remember. They are going all over the place. They finally come over here to Greece. Bad stuff happens. I mean, Paul is in Thessalonica and he plants a church and things seem to be going so well, but they boot him out of there. Uh, he was in Philippi before that and he plants a church and God uses him real big and he gets beaten and imprisoned. Uh, let's see, Berea. Do you remember he went from Thessalonica to Berea? What happens? He shares the Lord, loves people, plants a church, and the people go after him even there. And this is where we find ourselves now. So he gets chased out of cities on his missionary journey. He's loving people for Jesus. He's planting churches. People are coming together and like, you know, hugging each other in Christ. And he's the guy who gets run off. Now he's in Athens because... He gets kind of, what, dropped off there? Because Athens isn't really his, his goal city, so to speak. Actually, Corinth is. He's in Athens because his guys dropped him off there, and eventually they were going to meet him there, okay? But you got to understand that Athens is not a fun town for a Christian, at least the way maybe the world might think of it. Oh, you're not going to find anybody who's like you. Oh, you're, you know, it's going to be really tough. You don't want to go there. Here's the thing, Christian. That's, that's our field, right? That's our harvest field. It doesn't matter how difficult the world thinks it will be for us because I'll tell you what, when Pastor Tim called me at like midnight the other night and said, dude, we're, we're in Houston right now in a line with 200 people trying to figure out what we're going to do tonight. You know what? I, my heart went out to him as I was cozying up in my bed and kind of <laughs> hanging out. I was like, Tim, hold on, I got to yawn. Ugh. No, that's not. But he and our team, they had a great attitude. They were good to go. Yeah, they didn't get to their hotel until like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And they're still like, hey, Rod, you know what? This is where the Lord has us. And this is the way it's going to be. It, Paul is in Athens of all towns. He's probably like, you know what? This is where the Lord has me. So this is where I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do for him. So Athens is the place. Not very inviting for Christians. But when you're a Christian with a purpose which all of us are, it is the perfect place. Tell you what, let's pray, and we're going to check it out. Let's see what happens. All right, let's pray and get into it. God, thank you so much, uh, Lord, just for drawing us here together. A beautiful day, beautiful evening, Lord, where we now get to, well, first we got to worship you. We praise you for that. Thank you that we are brothers and sisters. We're drawn into fellowship here together. Thank you for that. Lord, now to be able to study together your word or the inspired words. These are the word of, this is the word of God that we have to study before us tonight. And Lord, in this privilege, we pray for power. Lord, in this privilege, we pray for preparation, that you would prepare our hearts to receive what you have. Lord, that you would prepare us not just to receive it, but, but to be changed by it to be transformed by it. And then, Lord, of course, to go into this world. This, there's darkness, Lord, but you want the light there and you've, you've given us that light. Lord, we want to be out there and we want to shine brightly for you. Lord, use us in those mighty ways. We will absolutely yield to your awesome power and your amazing will. We love you, Lord. We pr oh, Lord, also, we lift up our brothers and sisters on that missions trip. God, as they're boarding that plane, Lord, in New York, we just pray it would go well for them. It would go easy for them. Lord, give them just a relaxed time so that they can really prepare for disembarking into Brazil and getting on that portion of the trip. We just lift up each one. 
If there's any kind of an issue for one of them, a physical, emotional, we pray right now, please, just supernaturally, would you change that? Would you heal them? Would you give them sort of a, a new shot of strength as they go? We love you, Lord, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's see, Athens, and it's chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. Let me just read it, okay, all the way through to the end of the chapter. It says this, Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. We're going to, like, land on that for almost the entire study tonight. Um, Let's see. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. Now when all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend... Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling of hearing some, or hearing something new. <clears throat> So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Paul quotes two Greek poets right there. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And then here comes the responses. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Hmm, what a story Whoa, like Paul has the most amazing things happen to him when he goes on his little journeys, doesn't he? Everything is so unexpected, uh, but expected. He knows that God is going to use him, but here is the key. Lord, okay, I am willing. Lord, I submit. Remember, you guys, perspective, it matters. We've talked about this in the past. Your perspective matters. Why are you how about this question? Why are you who you are? Why are you you and you aren't me? By the way, praise God for that. But why? Why do you have the job that you have? Why, do you, why are you married to the spouse that you're married to? Why is it that you live in the house that you live in? You know, when we ask all of these questions, here's what we always have to make sure of. Man, first, it's perspective. It's a, can I say it this simply? It's a God thing. It's a God thing. That's, that's what Paul is. Man, he's staring at a city that hates 
the one true God and loves 30,000 gods. By the way, that's what historians say. These idols, something like 30,000 separate carved images. Have you heard that? 30,000 carved images. Paul goes into a place where it's 30,000 to one. And he goes, I'm taking it because this is a God thing. This is the life of a Christian. Man, every, every, you know, every new circumstance, every new place, every new thing, every new person, every new interaction, you guys, we have to see it as a God thing. We are on a mission. Our life is a missionary journey. Our life here, it is but a twinkle. Man, it goes that fast. And then it's done. And so God has you here where you are, who you are, as you are, when you are, because he, it's his thing, he has a purpose. He wants to take you and use you in ways that you and I, we would never really even think about. Who would have thought that a dude like Paul would have faced the city as monumental, I even mean that literally, all the monuments and stuff, but as monumental as Athens. You're talking about the cultural capital of the world. You're talking about the, 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 the educational capital of the world. They called Athens the university of the world. The city was called the university of the world. It was the religious capital of the world. I just told you there were 30,000 idols to whom some altar was built. I mean, how do you even fit that many in? Right? Have you heard the quote that says it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was a man? That's what, that's what people write of that city. One Christian guy is there. What could he have done? Could he have said, I'm done? Could he have just said, you know what? I'm waiting for my guys. I'll be at the hotel checking, hanging out. He could have. But that's not, what, that's not what Paul did. You know what he did? He realized this is a God thing. Lord, go ahead and use me. Here I am. Lord, my heart is open to you. How do you want to use it? Lord, I know my commitment is first and foremost and last, to the last, that is, to Christ my Lord. I know that you have a call in my life, and that is to share the gospel message because you see people here who are going to die and spend eternity in hell. And you want me to see them with your eyes. This is, this is you guys, this is the intro. Look at, look at verse 16 again, please. Now, while, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, I want you to see this. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. You got to understand Luke is writing, or uh, yeah, Luke is writing this. He's getting this story, right? He's getting the story. At this point, Luke is not there. So this story is being told to him. And you know what Paul doesn't do? He doesn't go, oh, dude, I saw the Parthenon up on the hill and it was the most amazing structure ever. You should have seen all of the beautiful architecture and the artistry. Oh, it was the, you know what? He has one thing to say about magnificent, immaculate, you know, uh, monumental Athens. It's full of idols. That was his commentary on an amazing city. That was the cultural, philosophical, uh, religious capital of planet Earth. He saw it and he just saw that it was full of idols. And then I want you to see where it says his spirit was provoked within him. Um, that provoke, it's, it's paroxuno. It's where we get the word paroxysm from. Uh, that's often, I think that's a medical term, but paroxysm. It's like, a, it's like a quick jolt. It's an agitation. It doesn't feel good, a paroxysm. It's something that kind of hurts. And what this, what this tells you it says, his spirit was provoked with him as he saw that the city was full of idols. I want you to understand something. That wasn't a singular statement. What that meant was, as he walked through Athens and every time he would like hit an altar, or he would see an idol, a paroxysm. He'd be like this, oh. And paroxysm means agitation to the point of pain. And so what it says is, every time I saw, uh, this is Paul speaking to Luke, okay? Let's just say, 
I'm giving the story to Luke as Paul. Paul, oh, Luke, listen, this is what it was, man. Athens? Uh, no, not Parthenon. No, no, no. Uh, Areopagus. Uh, okay, okay. The idols. Dude, every time I walked past one, it hurt. Like every time I saw one, every time I saw a woman wearing a trinket on her, on her neck, I went like this. Like I, it was so much for me, man. And the way Paul puts it here is individually so. Every time was an episode in my life. Every time. You guys, every person that God puts before you, and we're going to see that here. It's literally going to say that every single person that came across the path of Paul was Paul's target for the gospel. I mean, I want to be like that. I want to be like that guy. But this is what stimulates him. Okay? It hurts when we have the eyes of God to see as God sees. You know what? We see people who are destined for hell. And every time we see that person, we go like this, ow. I got some power. I don't know. A doctor knows how to treat this. A doctor is going to say, here, man, let me help you in your, your issue. And this is the kind of thing that Paul says, I will do because I have the power. I have the ability. I have something that's beyond me. And I want you to also notice, please, too, there that it says he was provoked in his spirit, which also tells us this very, very... I think it's an important thing not to overlook. In fact, I, in my own Bible, have spirit uh, circled. It, it's, have you ever heard me say this? You put on your Jesus glasses. Put on your Jesus as you're walking around. You know, when you want to see life, put on your Jesus glasses. Um, that's what he was doing. It says that he was provoked in the spirit. He saw everything from the spiritual through the spiritual glasses first, and then he analyzed it intellectually and then he, decide, he would make his little plan of here's what I'm going to do or here's what I'm going to say. And then we know that God often got in the way of that, right? He was going to go preach in Asia and God's like, nope, you're not going there. Still, Paul was acting in the spirit. He gets provoked. He sees everything in the spirit. He makes his little plan out and he goes and then it's up to God whether he's going to put somebody in his path to speak the gospel to or flip a U-turn and go back. But it's always the Lord's thing. The deal was... He submitted, he yielded in the spirit, responding to a provocation. And it's weird to say it this way, of pain. It's, you know, you, you know, you guys, when we say something like that, when we say, oh, it hurts, here's what we mean. We mean it is the love of Christ manifest. Okay, when I say that, the, that love hurts, oh, it hurts when I see that. What I mean is that is the love of Christ manifest. When he's dying on a, on a cross and blood is dripping down onto the ground and his flesh is so ripped up you can't even, you could look at him and go, wait a minute, is that Jesus? Because I don't really recognize the man. That, that Jesus, he endured the pain, right? He endured the cross. It said he bore it, Why? because of his love for us, because of his love for you and me. So when we say something like, oh, it hurts, you got to understand that's a God thing to say it that way. You're not saying it to, to draw any attention to yourself. You know, you're, you don't want to be weird about it. But you don't say it hurts. I, I want to love you like Jesus loved you. I want to do what Jesus did for you, whatever it takes, because I understand spiritually what this means. It's either your eternal destiny in hell or your eternal destiny with God. It's really that black and white. These are the kinds of things that go through my mind as I see one single man take on 30,000 idols, plus all the people that are there in the city. I, one more question. I, I do this. One more question before I get into that specific text. Um, is, and that's this. What about your city? What about your city? How do you see your city? Huh? We, Maybe I'm speaking literally to you. Maybe you're like the kind of person who wants to walk downtown and you just want to walk up to people and say, hi, you know Jesus loves you and I do too. Can I tell you about Jesus? Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe your city is your workplace. Maybe your city is your school. 
Maybe your city is, but there's a place God is taking to you that you cannot deny. You know that God put you there <laughs> like almost like this in a state of weirdness. Like, why am I here? Right? Like Paul's in Athens is kind of a state of weirdness, but it wasn't. I want to challenge you to, to pray that before the Lord in your own time. Lord, what is my city? Is this my city? And as soon as God reveals it, you guys don't sit on it. Go for it. That's what Paul's going to do right now. Okay, so this all, I told we were going to hit verse 16. Verse 16, again, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit, there were paroxysms, provoked, ah, pain every time because he looked through his Jesus glasses because he saw the darkness. He saw all of these idols. This is the way Christians do it. It says so this, here comes, ready? Here comes the response now. Okay, God, you've shown it. I love them like you do, so it hurts. Send me. And here comes verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those, <laughs> here's the key, who happened to be there. In the Greek, that literally means everyone who crossed his path. <laughs> that's, like I said, that's inspiring to me. It's a little scary, but it's inspiring too. So as he always does when he goes into a new city, where did Paul go first? He always went to the synagogue, always went to the synagogue first. He spoke to the Jews. He spoke to the, to the, to the Greeks, in this case, who had attached themselves to Judaism. And as Paul did, he reasoned from the scriptures. Remember, he used the scriptures. He would go back to Abraham or whatever else, and he would lead it right on up to show them that Jesus was the promised Messiah of the scriptures. He always used the scriptures. And we've had a past teaching about that. Well, here we don't get a lot of detail. We're just told that he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons. And then it says this, he did it in the marketplace. And that he did that every day. Every day. I'm simply impressed. So Paul shares the Lord and he does it because, what was it again? He's looking through his spiritual glasses, his Jesus glasses, yeah. Uh, he's feeling the, the paroxysms, he's feeling little agitation, the pain, yeah. And, and he says, anybody God who you bring across my path, I will go ahead and share your message to. In my own notes, listen, I put this, we all need to have a marketplace ministry. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, I was reading statistics and studies and all that stuff, but I learned that since 1991, the number of adults in our nation who haven't ever been to a church has doubled, has doubled. That's less than 30 years, isn't it? If my math is right, that's 27, 28 years. The number of adults in this nation who, hasn't, who haven't ever gone to a church has doubled. That is a phenomenal increase in the number of adults who don't or have never gone to a church. I mean, even my parents have gone to a church. Um, wait, I got another one here. 85 million adults, this is Pew Research, by the way, 85 million adults say that they have no future intention of ever visiting a church. 85 million say they will not do it. As much as I wish that we could draw people into the church so that I can proclaim the message of Jesus and we can share the love of Christ as the body of Christ, as much as you and I want that. You guys, the hard numbers say the likelihood is very little. The primary way people come to church is when another Christian draws them in. And the primary way that happens is through the establishment of a relationship. You know, we can put 
we, we can do all that we can as a church to let this community know that we love them, we care for them. We have ministries in schools now. Remember, we did the bike clinic. We've done um, the VBS for kids all over this community. Uh, we have the, op the, um, the uh, Bible club. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Marianne's going to kill me. Mary, the, yeah, the Good News Club. See, she's right there. We have the Good News Club, and it's going on in two elementary schools in our community. We are reaching out to people left and right. Right? But you, the individual, so say the statistics, are much more effective. You, individually, even by God's design here, can be much more effective. We all need a marketplace ministry. That means that you actually have to approach people. You need to tell them about Jesus. You need to tell them about church. You need to encourage and entice and do all of those things because people will listen much more to you than the guy standing behind a podium on the stage. They are more inclined to listen to you individually. And I think Paul knew that. That's why he said, God, any one person you put in my path, I will walk up to that person and say, hi, did you know Jesus loves you? Or whatever Paul says. This is what I would call our marketplace ministry. So I want to challenge you as well, okay? First of all was, what is your city? And then secondly, my marketplace ministry. Let's go on. What else, does, what else happens here? So he does that thing. It says, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, we'll talk about them, also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Okay, well, hey, at least some of the smart guys had a reaction to what Paul had to say. Because, by the way, the way this is written, it's sort of like this, the normal people and the smart guys. And it wasn't condescending. That's not it at all. A distinction is made because back in Athens, there were distinctions like that. You were a smart dude or you were just kind of one of the normals. And so it's in, I think it's cool that we actually get to see the distinction here. Because you're going to notice in the very end, you know who it's going to say um, gets saved or who follows him? One of the guys on the council, right? I, I can't remember his name, but I'll get to it. And then a woman who has no title. Now, typically, when you just get a woman, you don't recognize her by title. You don't name that she is the wife of or blah, blah, blah. That normally means she's just a normal girl. So what's so cool here is in the very end, what this is going to say is through the city God put before Paul, through the marketplace ministry, and just, you know, sharing the gospel... Uh, from the lowest to the highest, get saved. From the most normal to the most educated, get saved. You guys see, these little details matter because they're supposed to encourage you. Don't, don't like get intimidated. Sometimes it can be intimidating to talk to like, you know, professor so-and-so or somebody who has, you know, 10 degrees or, or has lots of knowledge or something. Who cares? You know, you've got the gospel that you're, you're presenting, right? The gospel is the power. And that's, that's the power that saved. That's the power um, unto salvation. And so, uh, hey, if it worked on Mr. High and Mighty Intellectual Council guy and Miss Normal Citizen of Athens, it'll work for anybody. All right, so here's what it says. These Stoics and these Epicureans, they finally respond. Now, the, I don't want to get real deep into it, okay? Epicureans, more or less, they were the ones who said, live for the moment, okay? They weren't atheists, but practically speaking, because they didn't believe that there were gods that you had personal relationship with. There were gods, but they were off in their own thing, never a connection between humanity and divinity. So they'd like, don't even think about the divine part of it. So they would tell you, okay, if you have a soul, it's attached to your body. When your body dies, your soul dies. So what's the end result? Live for now, you know? Make it feel good. Live in the moment, the, the, the current pleasure. That was sort of the Epicurean thing in a nutshell. Yes, it is much broader. Yes, there are like six or seven segments to Epicureanism. That's not what we're talking about right here. 
Just remember they're saying, pleasure is the main purpose of life. So that's one group. Uh, Stoics, what about the Stoics? Uh, Zeno, the guy from Athens, Zeno, the philosopher. He teaches in essence, uh, pan, you know, pantheism, everything is God, God is everything. You know, the rocks, the trees, the mountains, you, me, the cosmos, everything God. That, that's, a, that's a stoic position. They were more about like, uh, just kind of take it. You know, just, just to grin and bear it. You ever heard that one before? Grin and bear it. Whatever comes, comes. Whatever happens, happens. Don't overreact. Be real even keeled and you're good to go. Like they would even be called humanitarians. They would help other people. You know, they cared about you. Whereas the Epicureans were like, dude, leave me alone. I'm taking care of me. So again, I think what God is showing us is that he, the gospel goes to all corners, to all perspectives, to all philosophies. Mm. So here they are listening to Paul. Some of them call him a babbler. Do you know literally that means seed picker? It's a, it's, a, it's a reference to a marketplace sparrow. They had these little birds that flew around in the marketplace, and you'd see them, and they'd just kind of pick up seeds here, pieces of food there, and they would try to feed themselves with whatever they could. So they actually ascribed that term to Paul. They called him a seed picker. And what that meant philosophically was you don't really have a cogent, coherent, steady, consistent argument to make. You're taking a little piece of Epicureanism here, a little piece of Stoicism here, a little piece of blah, blah, blah there. You're trying to get them all together and tell us, this is knowledge. Because remember, they were all about knowledge. Now, you're just a seed picker, dude. This is garbage. All right, fine. Some of them said that. You know what? Some people will call you and me seed pickers, right? So to speak. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, we should always only get it out of here, so don't be picking it out of anywhere else. But some people are going to make those kinds of ridiculous comments, and you just, whatever. That's between you and the Lord. So here he gets their attention. They call, some of them ridicule him. Uh, some, on the other hand, misunderstood. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. You see where it says uh, it, they're thinking that Paul has some new thing for them, right? They're all into knowledge. They're all intellectualism, all education. So they think they're about to learn something new, particularly about these 30,000 idols. Maybe now it's 30,000 plus more. Maybe that's what it is. It's an interesting, it's an interesting detail here, but very intentional that they use plurally foreign divinities. They use the word gods, not God, as if Paul were introducing a new God. The way it's structured in the original language, it literally means more than one God. So the best, I, I agree, I think this is the best response or the, the best reason why is because they thought that Paul was saying, I have two gods to introduce to you. One's name is Jesus, one's name is resurrection. The God Jesus and the God resurrection. And so what they just heard was, wow, this man has two new gods to introduce to us or to tell us about today. And by the way, in Athens, that wasn't uncommon. Like they had gods to like abstract concepts. They had gods, you know, to... Uh, to, to, to um, uh, mercy. You know, they had gods to virtue. They had these kinds of things. So if he said, you know, it's a God resurrection, okay, we can, we can see that come together. But sir, we would like to know more. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. It says, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Notice that the Holy Spirit told us to know, verse 21. 
all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Can human beings get caught up? Oh, let's see. In really, really irrelevant, boy, I could go off on this one. Irrelevant topic, let me keep it clean. Irrelevant topics as far as their existence, as far as their eternal state, as far as all of those things go. Yes, of course they can. Here's the deal, Christian. Don't get caught up in it. That's, I think that's just the most important thing. For a believer, don't, don't go off and get yourself too stuck in some topics that don't actually, well, that aren't part of like, for example, the Great Commission. You know, some people invest like their entire lives in, in, in end time prophecy. I think it's an awesome thing to know, but nowhere in scripture are you told to dedicate your time of ministry into end times prophecy. We're not told to spend all that time there. We're told to know of it, but we know of it. Why? To inspire us to react. Because I know the end times are coming and I know that the time is now, it's supposed to make me go, I shall follow the Great Commission. And then off I go. So Christians can even get lost in this stuff. But then, of course, also what he's telling us is, look, there are going to be people, they're not believers, they're going to listen to you, they're going to kind of chastise you, they'll ask those questions that almost don't matter. You need to know, church, and this has got to be a topic for another day, but you need to know when enough is enough. You need to, be, you need to know. Jesus, he didn't stay on one person or one group. Paul, the others, they didn't stay on one person or one group. They shared the gospel. They answered questions when they felt that the answer to the question was fruitful. But as soon as they, as soon as they sensed or realized this is not going to become fruitful or this is one of those vain, irrelevant, babbling things, they were able to say enough is enough. This is a very important part of the Christian, I think, experience. Don't get caught up in it and recognize if somebody tries to catch you in it. So that's verse, that's verse, 20, uh, verse 21. Here comes. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus. Now, the, you know, I was supposed to show you a, a picture of the Parthenon, but that's okay. So the Areopagus is this little hill that's located right there. Oh, there it is, the little hill, right? <laughs> um, this angle is, you know that, uh, you guys put up the Parthenon, would you, if you can? I'm putting a lot of pressure on. Oh, there it is, okay. So that's the, that's the big temple that everybody knows of Athens, right? It's called the Parthenon. And so it's on um, this, this little section above Athens in known as the Acropolis. It's like a little, a little area of buildings, of temples and other things, and it's all up there. So the Acropolis is up here, just a little bit north and to the west, is what is called this, the Areopagus, which is that little hill that you just saw. Yeah, you guys, put that picture of the hill back on. So now you're looking at it from the Parthenon, and that is what is called Mars Hill. Okay, Mars Hill. We call it Mars Hill. Areopagus is just a translation because Mars is the god of war. It meant war. Uh, it, it, it meant, um, let's see, god of war rock which meant Mars Hill. That's why you'll get Mars Hill out of it, okay? But that's, so that's where Paul went and before this, this group. Now, it was well known. I mean, people went to Mars Hill. People went to the court and presented their cases and they talked philosophy and a lot of this vain stuff and all that. And so they said, hey, Paul, sounds like you got some stuff to tell us. Come on, come with us and, and tell us about it. So here's Paul now on Mars Hill, and he's about to do most amazing. Who'd have thought? Remember you guys how we started this whole thing? Just one guy, one Christian who would not want to be in Athens. He made himself open, and look where God's got him now. Verse 22, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, 
I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. Ah, this I proclaim to you. Now let's look at it. How about this? How about Paul's presentation? So Paul knew that he was called there by the Lord to share the gospel. He knew because he saw through his Jesus classes that these were unsaved men and women that he was looking at all around, all over the place. Every time he saw an idol, oh, he got a little pain in his spirit. And so now what he has to do is present to this particular group the message of the gospel. Again, this has to be a topic for another day, but I want you to think about, about this. Let's see, how deep do I get? Um, when you present the gospel, context matters. And when I talk about context, I'm talking about surroundings. I'm talking about culture. I'm talking about the little details of your audience. All of those things, context matters. When you share the gospel with, let's say, you know, 85-year-old Grandma Joan, it's going to be different than sharing the gospel with eight year old grandson Jeff. It's just going to be different. It's the same message of the gospel, but because the context is different, your presentation has to be different. So this, we, we would just call this contextualization. So that's what you see Paul doing, okay? He is contextualizing the gospel. Now here's one point that I want you to understand when you contextualize. You are shooting for two things. I'm sorry I don't have this written, so either write it down or remember it or something. But you're shooting for two things. One, you are shooting for a point of contact, also known as a point of commonality. Okay? You're shooting for a point of contact or a point of commonality. However, what you want to do in that contact or commonality is create conflict. So you go from contact or commonality to conflict. So that's the, that's the purpose of contextualization. You get them in to get them out. You connect your hearts to make them go, wait a minute, I wanna stay connected to you, man, not to that. So you have to connect, but you have to create conflict. Otherwise, there's no incentive for them to listen to what you have to say. Otherwise, they're going to say, so what if you got Jesus? I got, you know, Muhammad. That's why you have to bring that place of commonality or contact and then get to that place of conflict. That's exactly the method that Paul is going to use here. So think about it now, okay? Contextualization, here's what he says. He goes, um, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. There you go. Is that commonality? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Is that a point of contact? Yes. He made them and their stuff important to himself. You know all this work and stuff that you guys did? Wow. Like I checked it out. Like it really mattered. Now here comes. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. Not exactly conflict, but it definitely sort of uh, entices them. Something is about to come here. So, so the introduction, you guys just study this, okay? I, I would be able to give you an entire study just on that verse alone, but we're going to we're gonna have to continue through. But I can tell you this. Um, I think Paul, as a Christian, looking at what he saw, could you imagine walking through a city, 30,000 idols, and then seeing a place, an altar that says, to the unknown God? How would that break your heart? Huh? How? Oh, I hope it does. Uh, that's what we have to see all around us. That's what we have to watch on TV. That's, that's what we have to listen through the news. You know those, those stories that you just want to punch the reporter? You need to look at it like this. You understand what's inspiring them? 
the gospel isn't inspiring them. It's, it's the flesh. It's this whole idea of Stoicism and Epicureanism and everybody in between and everybody outside. And so Paul just said, okay, okay, let me, let me get into your world. And he walks past and he, and he says this. He says, I, I can see what idolatry does. I can see what, you know, agnosticism does. I can see what atheism does. I can see what everything does when it is not focused on the one true God. And I am now going to tell you about it. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Okay, here's a point of conflict, because they got temples all over the place, especially that Parthenon. Uh, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Like, whoa. Like, that is a mind blower right there. His first point I made this into three points. First one is this, okay, how he stunned them. He said, God is the maker, not the made. God is the creator, not the created. Okay, that was his first point right there. Blew him away. When you have 30,000 hand-carved idols and altars and stuff, what do you think? Man's going to think he's kind of all that. Okay, well, this might be the God to so-and-so, but look whose knife carved it, you know? Look who had to do the work in the metal shop and all that to make it look just so. And man, you'll notice whenever, oh, you guys, outside of biblical Christianity, man always has some kind of power over God. Man always can do something which will force the hand of that God. It might be a particular prayer. It might be a particular ritual, a particular sacrifice. It can be anything. But what that means is to some degree, one or another, the man has some sort of power over the God. And what Paul is saying here is, I want to wipe that entire concept right off the table right now. Because the one true God, he's not even in that in the remotest He's in his own dimension. He's always been. We haven't. We came from his hand. He didn't come from our hand. And so what are they, looking at 30,000 idols or looking out into the city and stuff? I don't know. Were they wearing little trinkets? Probably. But this is, this is pretty stellar. Paul says God is greater. But he doesn't just say greater. He turns it into infinity greater. God is God, you are not. There is a chasm that cannot be crossed. So God is the maker, not the made. Here's another one. God is the giver. He has no need to be given to. Okay? God is the giver. He doesn't need man to give him anything. God is the God who gives all things that provide for life. God is the God who provides all things that allows you to, to live and breathe and move and everything else. And this is not the way they had pictured at the time. Now, they would think that a God could suddenly come down and strike you dead with lightning. But they didn't think a God literally kept your heart beating. You know, we, we, we believe God's in it all. We believe God's in it, man. He's there. He just took... He just took that God and he put him there. Now, that's stellar. That's something that they would never have thought of. God is the giver. He doesn't need you. In fact, he gives himself to you. Remember what the Epicureans thought? They believed that there were, quote, gods, but the gods had removed themselves. They had absolutely no interest in humanity, none. And yet here's Paul saying, wow, not only do you not have to do anything for him, he's going to do everything for you because you matter to him that much. That was a mind blower right there. Guys, as far as idolatry goes, let's see, so giver. Let me, let me read you a note that I've made to myself here, okay? Um, he identifies them as religious people. That's the point of contact or commonality. He says, you're important to me. Like I walked around and I checked stuff out and, you know, I want to explain it. 
then he gives them these sort of conflicting things with what they knew versus what was true. Here's where I would want to go next with Paul. (laughs) And I know he's clean on this. He would have to make sure that he himself is not an idolater. Okay, you understand what an idolater is? An idolater, you are worshiping something that you call God. And if that something is anything but the true God of the Bible, that is your idol, that is your God. You are an idolater. Okay, that's what idolatry means. So if, if Paul had you know, decided that he was going to spend a lot of his time, let's say, making money when he didn't really need to, he only needed to sell some tents or do something, then he would be demonstrating to these people, actually, there's a little idolatry in my life. And money happens to be my idol. Uh, idolatry, you guys, it's, it's dangerous because it, it, it's, it, oh man, sometimes it's inconspicuous. Sometimes it just gets in there. Sometimes it's very overt. But we don't think about it like that. Like kids, kids can become idols. Because you see entire lives change where it's like, you know, everything now revolves around the child till, the, till they're 18. And the whole family's life, I've seen that many times. Self can be an idol. Worship of self. I mean, come on, how much do we see that nowadays, right? That's like the religion of the day. Self-worship. But idolatry, um, a husband, a wife can be an idol. A hobby can be an idol. Anything can be an idol. If it demonstrates that it holds more, what would you say, priority in your life than God? Uh, takes more of your attention than your God? Uh, what else? You, you, you dedicate more to it than your God? You sort of, your life evolves around it rather than your God? Sure. And you can come up with all of these things in your own head. But whatever you can come up with that answers yes to those questions is an idol to you. So you have to be able to go before the Lord every morning and actually very humbly say, Lord, would you reveal my idol? Lord, would you cleanse me of this? You know, I'm sorry, God, that I have put somebody or something before you. This idolatry. It could be a job. It could be a friend. It could be some passion. It could be anything, you guys. But oh, You have to be that careful because this is precisely what Paul is speaking up against. Anything that competes with the God of truth is wrong. 30,000 plus whatever. Okay, so this is what Paul had to make sure he was not a hypocrite, but he himself demonstrated God is the God of truth. Okay, so God is the maker. God is the giver. Let's move on here. Verse 26 seven and eight, I have this. God is the drawer, D-R-A-W-E-R. And that means drawing others to himself. And he made from one, one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. You see how he he wanted always through history to draw people to himself? Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. In other words, why did men always have to make it so hard to get to God when God's history with mankind was open arms? That's what he was saying right there. And then he quotes a couple of Greek poets for In him we live and move and have our being as, I'm sorry, for for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Um, Paul was trying to make this concept palpable. They could not think of a God who's just there with his arms open and ready to receive you like a daddy, his little child. They would make these these poets, they would speak this sort of stuff, but that was just, you know, that was verbal artistry, that's all. It had no real truth attached to it. And so Paul had to make the point that you guys, every consider your history. Oh, by the way, Athens, 
they knew their history very well. They, the, 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 Greece, the Greeks, the Romans, all of that, that entire uh, system was very well documented. They knew it all. And so Paul would even be able to say, look, think back in your own records and all the stuff that you know. Everything that happened was because there is a God who has his arms open and has only wanted to draw you to himself. You see, these are, again, these are mind-blowing things. You would call them conflicting in their minds. I don't think they wanted to punch him, but it would have just, it made them go, what? And we're actually going to see the response at the end. But, but that's where he takes them here. Nothing is arbitrary. That's craziness. They thought so much was arbitrary in those days. They were just like, well, if it happens, it happens. Oh, man, coincidence. Oh, man, whatever. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He's had his eye on you for so long. In fact, all of humanity. That from the very beginning, he set his plan in place to draw you into himself. In Hebrews 11:6, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he is a rewarder to those who seek him. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, he goes, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It's been historical God. He has always had his arms open. He's always made the circumstances so that you can come to him. Now, look, you guys, sometimes, yes, it meant war. Sometimes it did mean genocide. Sometimes it meant just really yucky things. But what Paul was trying to say is don't stop there. Because if your perspective ever stops there, you're dead in the water. You've got to think bigger. You've got to think heavenly. You've got to think with those spiritual glasses. He goes, if you think about it that way, then every one of your recorded wars and genocides and all that junk make sense. It's because there's a God who loves you and he just wants you to be his child. This is your offspring. Don't, don't, don't think about it in any other way. You're, you're his offspring. In fact, let's go on. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring... We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. And that's kind of self-explanatory, right? Got it. Absolutely not. So here it comes. Here's the biggie. Verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked... In other words, he didn't just zap you with lightning and kill all of mankind once and for all for all of their sin, <laughs> even though I think he wanted to do that a time or two. He didn't. He goes, okay, okay, but now, now, he's commanding all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. We know him to be Jesus. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul always ended his gospel message with the reference to the resurrection. If he be not raised, then all of this is meaningless. It was the resurrection. Every time Paul shares the gospel, that's his formula. This is, uh, I, I think about it like this. People of Athens, let me now, let me now trans, let me, let me now shift our focus. Let's go from philosophy to reality to responsibility. So he takes their philosophy and he creates a commonality with reality. Oh, wait, let me see if I got that right. A common point, right? A commonality, yeah. So he takes philosophy and he connects it to reality. Got it? There's your common point right there, your connector. Now here's the crazy part. He goes, but I want to take this reality and I want to turn it into a responsibility. That's the part that drives him. See, that's the conflict because now he puts it on you. He goes, okay, I just taught you. You guys are all intellectual. You want to know stuff. Here's your stuff. Here you go. I just clarified some things about this unknown God. Okay, we got, all right, Paul, that was a little tough. We're trying to process it. He goes, but wait a minute, that's not all. Now that you know it, you got to respond to it. 
And that's your point of conflict. Because he has fixed a day, he says, when he will judge you. You better know that if you don't answer, if you don't respond the way you're called to, you will be judged. That means verdict will be rendered, consequence, you shall pay. Or, or, you can know about this man. He's righteous. That, in effect, would be them hearing this. There is a perfect man who was appointed to this, right? So unlike you, unlike me, there was a special guy. And if you respond to this special guy, something special will happen to you. So here's your point of responsibility right here. Are you going to answer it or are you not? And you can just picture the people. I don't know, you guys. You can just kind of figure it out. What are they thinking? He goes from philosophy to reality to responsibility. Verses 32, 33, and 34, this is it. What happens? Now when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some mocked. Because he used that as a stamp. But others said, okay, okay, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite. See, there's a title. That means he was a man of great influence. And then this, and a woman named Damaris. You don't know who her family is. She has no title. What that tells you and me is she was just a woman in the city who believed. Oh, and others. <laughs> and others. Don't you love how, Jesus, uh, how God does that when people get saved? So, hmm, what do you think? I was looking at that final part there, you guys. You know, if I'm going to be like Paul in Athens, let's go back to the beginning of our study because I'm, I'm done here. Let's go back to the beginning of what we talked about. So a Christian named Paul gets thrown before the city called Athens, and they ain't a good fit if you only look at it from a fleshly point of view. If you look at it from a spiritual point of view, it was like, dude, Paul, there is, man, harvest, right? Field is, field is ready. That's you and I. We got the city, but we got whatever else. He's calling you by name, and he's saying, there, there's the field. Go and harvest. So Paul does it. He goes through. Remember, every time he sees something that violates his glorious God and demonstrates dying people. Remember, he had that, oh, that paroxysm, that thing in his heart, that agitation. As we look at people, we look at them with the love of Jesus. And that's why we can say, it pains me to see that you don't know Jesus. Okay, so that's number two. You love them like Jesus does. Okay, so what, what happens next? <clears throat> you make the effort. You go. You say, okay, Lord. So Paul goes into the, what does it say? He goes into the synagogue. He goes into the marketplace. And he just presents it to anybody who will bump into him. Right? He says, anybody who crossed his path. You and I, you guys, we have to be bold. We have to be yielded. Lord, okay, if you're going to bring this person into my path, I'm going for it. Okay, then what, what happened next? Something happens, whether it's the person you're talking to directly or something else, something spawns, and you're going to just say, praise the Lord, something spawns. How am I going to react to that? In this case, it was Paul going, hey, um, I get to go up there. I get to go to Mars Hill. And so off he goes. So when you have that willingness and that submission to it, God does the next thing and you react. And then what? You have a real presentation of the gospel here now, you guys. So what did I say? You got to be thoughtful. And I talked about this thing called contextualization, which means you know your people. You know the world around you. You know what's going on. And you pray and you seek after the Lord. Lord, how can I connect with them? What's that point of commonality? And you present that connection. You present that point of commonality. And you, you, you what did I say? You go from um, philosophy to reality. You have to drive them towards the reality of, of the God of the Bible. And then what? Once you have the commonality, once you have that point there, you have to drive them to the point of conflict. Take them from the reality to the responsibility. And that's going to be something, again, that's you. The Holy Spirit will lead you to it, you guys. But you have to be willing to do it. You have to be ready. You have to know with full confidence, if God got me to Mars Hill, something more is going to happen here. 
And what happens after that? Is that your responsibility? No. Some big, high-flying guy in the town said yes to Jesus. And some sweet, we'll just say this, some sweet little mommy in town also said yes to Jesus and others. Those weren't Paul's responsibility. Those were God's. But you know what Paul got to do? He got to look back and he, <laughs> he got to look back at it all. So, wow, Lord, what a plan you had for me. Wow, Lord, how perfect is your will for my life? Man, God, if my flesh would have beat my spirit, I would have been in a hotel room waiting for my guys. You and I, let's, let's, let's consider the life that God has given to you. Actually, this is how I started it all. Why are you, you? Consider the life God's given to you. See how it is that Lord will use you as he used Paul there in Athens. Let's pray.